This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Plague Ship by Andre Norton. Chapter 1 Perfumed Planet. Dane Thorson. Cargo Master Apprentice of the Solar Queen, Galactic Free Trader Spacer, Terra Registry, stood in the middle of the ship's cramped bather, while Rip Shannon, Assistant Astrogator and his senior in the service of trade by some four years, applied gobs of highly scented paste to the skin between Dane's rather prominent shoulder blades. The small cabin was thickly redolent with spicy odors, and Rip sniffed appreciatively. "'You're sure going to be about the best-smelling Terran who ever set boot on Sargol's soil.' His soft slur of speech ended in a rich chuckle. Dane snorted and tried to estimate the progress over one shoulder. "'The things we have to do for trade,' his comment carried a hint of present embarrassment. "'Get it well in. This stuff's supposed to hold for hours. It had better. According to Van, those salariki can talk your ears right off your head and say nothing worth hearing. And we have to sit and listen until we get a straight answer out of them. Phew! He shook his head. In such close quarters the scent, pleasing as it was, was also overpowering. We would have to pick a world such as this. Rip's dark fingers halted their circular motion. Dane! he warned. Don't you go talking against this venture. We got it soft, and we're going to be credit happy, if it works out. But, perversely, Dane held to a gloomier view of the immediate future. If, he repeated. There's a galaxy of ifs in this Sargol proposition. All very well for you to rest easy on your fins, you don't have to run about smelling like a spice works before you can get the time of day from one of the natives. Rip put down the jar of cream. Different worlds, different customs, he iterated the old tag of the service. Be glad this one is so easy to conform to. There are some I can think of. There, he ended his massage with a stinging slap. You're all evenly greased. Good thing you don't have Van's bulk to cover. It takes him a good hour to get his cream on, even with Frank helping to spread. Your clothes ought to be steamed up and ready, too, by now. He opened a tight wall cabinet, originally intended to sterilize clothing which might be contaminated by contact with organisms inimical to Terrans. A cloud of steam, fragrant with the same spicy scent, poured out. Dane gingerly tugged loose his trade uniform, its brown silky fabric damp on his skin as he dressed. Luckily Sargal was warm. When he stepped out on its ruby-tinted soil this morning, no lingering taint of his off-world origin must remain to disgust the sensitive nostrils of the Salariki. He supposed he would get used to this process. After all, this was the first time he had undergone the ritual. But he couldn't lose the secret conviction that it was all very silly. Only what Rip had pointed out was the truth. One adjusted to the customs of aliens, or one didn't trade. And there were other things he might have had to do on other worlds which would have been far more upsetting to that core of private fastidiousness which few would have suspected existed in his tall, lanky frame. Phew! Out in the open with you! Ali Camille, apprentice engineer, screwed his two regular features into an expression of extreme distaste, and waved Dane by him in the corridor. For the sake of his shipmate's olfactory nerves, Dane hurried on to the port, which gave on the ramp, now tying the queen to Sargal's crust. But there he lingered, waiting for Van Rijk, 
the cargo master of the spacer, and his immediate superior. It was early morning, and now that he was out of the confinement of the ship, the fresh morning winds cut about him, rippling through the blue-green grass forest beyond, to take much of his momentary irritation with them. There were no mountains in this section of Sargal, the highest elevations being rounded hills tightly clothed with the same ten-foot grass which covered the plains. From the Queen's observation ports one could watch the constant ripple of the grass, so that the planet appeared to be largely clothed in a shimmering, flowing carpet. To the west were the seas, stretches of shallow water so cut up by strings of islands that they more resembled a series of salty lakes. And it was what was to be found in those seas which had lured the Solar Queen to Sargal. Though by rights the discovery was that of another trader, Traxt Cam, who had bid for trading rights to Sargal, hoping to make a comfortable fortune, or at least expenses with a slight profit, in the perfume trade, exporting from the scented planet some of its more fragrant products. But once on Sargal he had discovered the Koro stones, gems of a new type, a handful of which offered across the board in one of the inner planet trading marts had nearly caused a riot among bidding gem merchants. And Cam had been well on the way to becoming one of the princes of trade when he had been drawn into the vicious net of the Limbian pirates and finished off. Because they too had stumbled into the trap which was Limbo, and had had a very definite part in breaking up that devilish installation, the crew of the Solar Queen had claimed as their reward the trading rights of Traxt Cam in default of legal heirs. So here they were on Sargal, with the notes left by Cam as their guide, and as much lore concerning the Salariki as was known crammed into their minds. Dane sat down on the end of the ramp, his feet on Sargullian soil, thin red soil, with glittering bits of gold flake in it. He did not doubt that he was under observation from hidden eyes, but he tried to show no sign that he guessed it. The adult Celeriki maintained at all times an attitude of aloof and complete indifference toward the traders. But the juvenile population were as curious as their elders were contemptuous. Perhaps there was a method of approach in that. Dane considered the idea. Van Rijk and Captain Jellicoe had handled the first negotiations, and the process had taken most of a day, the result totaling exactly nothing. In their contacts with the off-world men, the feline ancestored Salariki were ceremonious, wary, and completely detached. But Cam had gotten to know them somehow, or he would not have returned from his first trip with that pouch of coro stones. Only, among his records salvaged on Limbo, he had left absolutely no clue as to how he had beaten down native sales resistance. It was baffling. But patience had to be the middle name of every traitor, and Dane had complete faith in Van. Sooner or later the cargo master would find a key to unlock the Salariki. As if the thought of Dane's chief had summoned him, Van Rijk, his scented tunic sealed to his bull's neck in unaccustomed trimness, his cap on his blond head, strode down the ramp, broadcasting waves of fragrance as he moved. He sniffed vigorously as he approached his assistant, and then nodded in approval. "'So you're all greased and ready. Is the captain coming too, sir?' Van Rijk shook his head. "'This is our headache. Patience, my boy, patience.' He led the way through a thin screen of grass on the other side of the scorched landing field to a well-packed earth road. Again Dane felt eyes, knew that they were being watched. But no Celeric stepped out of concealment. At least they had nothing to fear in the way of attack. Traders were immune, taboo and the trading stations were set up under the white diamond shield of peace, a peace guaranteed on blood oath by every clan chieftain in the district. 
even in the midst of inter-clan feuding, deadly enemies met in amity under that shield and would not turn claw-knife against each other within a two-mile radius of its protection. The grass forest rustled betrayingly, but the Terrans displayed no interest in those who spied upon them. An insect with wings of brilliant green gauze detached itself from the stalk of a grass tree and fluttered ahead of the traders, as if it were an official herald. From the red soil crushed by their boots arose a pungent odor, which fought with the scent they carried with them. Dane swallowed three or four times, and hoped his superior officer had not noticed that sign of discomfort. Though Van Rijk, in spite of his general air of sleepy benevolence and careless goodwill, noticed everything, no matter how trivial, which might have a bearing on the delicate negotiations of galactic trade. He had not climbed to his present status of expert cargo-master by overlooking anything at all. Now he gave an order. Take an equalizer. Dane reached for his belt pouch, flushing, fiercely determined inside himself that no matter how smells warred about him that day, he was not going to let it bother him. He swallowed the tiny pellet Medic Tau had prepared for just such trials and tried to occupy his mind with the work to come. If there would be any work, or would another long day be wasted in futile speeches of mutual esteem which gave formal lip-service to trade and its manifest benefits? Oh! The cry, which was half-wail, half-arrogant warning, sounded along the road behind them. Van Rijk's stride did not vary. He did not turn his head show any sign he had heard that heralding fanfare for a clan chieftain. And he continued to keep to the exact center of the road, Dane the regulation one pace to the rear and left as befitted his lower rank. How The blast from the throat of a salaric, especially chosen for his lung power, was accompanied now by the hollow drum of many feet. The Terrans neither looked around nor withdrew from the center, nor did their pace quicken. That, too, was an order, Dane knew. To the rank-conscious Salariki clansmen, you did not yield precedence unless you wanted at once to acknowledge your inferiority. And if you did that by some slip of admission or omission, there was no use in trying to trade face to face with their chieftains again. Ow! The blast behind was a scream as the retinue it announced swept around the bend in the road to catch sight of the two traders oblivious of it. Dane longed to be able to turn his head, just enough to see which of the local lordlings they blocked. Ow! There was a questioning note in the cry now, and the heavy thud-thud of feet was slacking. The clan party had seen them, were hesitant about the wisdom of trying to shove them aside. Van Rijk marched steadily onward, and Dane matched his pace. They might not possess a leather-lunged herald to clear their road, but they gave every indication of having the right to occupy as much of it as they wished. And that unruffled poise had its effect upon those behind. The pound of feet slowed to a walk, a walk which would keep a careful distance behind the two Terrans. It had worked. The Salariki, or the Salariki, were accepting them at their own valuation, a good omen for the day's business. Dane's spirits rose, but he schooled his features into a mask as wooden as his superiors. After all, this was a very minor victory, and they had ten or twelve hours of polite and hidden maneuvering before them. The Solar Queen had set down as closely as possible to the trading center marked on Traxcam's private map, and the Terrans now had another five minutes march, in the middle of the road, ahead of the chieftain who must be inwardly boiling at their presence, 
before they came out in the clearing containing the roofless, circular erection which served the Celeriki of the district as a marketplace and a common meeting ground for truce talks and the mending of private clan alliances. Erect on a pole in the middle, towering well above the nodding fronds of the grass trees, was the pole bearing the trade shield, which promised not only peace to those under it, but a three-day sanctuary to any feuder or duelist who managed to win to it and lay hands upon its weathered standard. They were not the first to arrive, which was also a good thing. Gathered in small groups about the walls of the council place were the personal attendants liege warriors, and the younger relatives of at least four or five clan chieftains. But Dane noted at once there was not a single curtain litter or riding orgle to be seen. None of the feminine part of the Salariki species had arrived. Nor would they until the final trade treaty was concluded and established by their fathers, husbands, or sons. With the assurance of one who was master in his own clan, Van Rijk, displaying no interest at all in the shifting mass of lower-rank Salariki, marched straight on to the door of the enclosure. Two or three of the younger warriors got to their feet, their brilliant cloaks flicking out like spreading wings. But when Van Rijk did not even lift an eyelid in their direction, they made no move to block his path. As fighting men, Dane thought, trying to study the specimens before him with a totally impersonal stare, the Salariki were an impressive lot. Their average height was close to six feet their distant feline ancestry apparent only in small vestiges. A Salaric's nails on both hands and feet were retractile. His skin was gray, his thick hair, close to the texture of plushy fur, extended down his backbone and along the outside of his well-muscled arms and legs, and was tawny yellow, blue-gray, or white. To Terran eyes, the broad faces, now all turned in their direction, lacked readable expression. The eyes were large and set slightly aslant in the skull, being startlingly orange-red or a brilliant turquoise-green-blue. They wore loincloths of brightly dyed fabrics with wide sashes forming corslets about their slender middles, from which gleamed the gem-set hilts of their claw-knives, the possession of which proved their adulthood. Cloaks as flamboyant as their other garments hung in bat-wing folds from their shoulders, and each and every one moved in an invisible cloud of perfume. Brilliant as the assemblage of liegemen without had been, the gathering of clan leaders and their upper officers within the council place was a riot of color and odor. The chieftains were installed on the wooden stools, each with a small table before him on which rested a goblet bearing his own clan sign, a folded strip of patterned cloth, his trade shield, and a gemmed box containing the scented paste he would use for refreshment during the ordeal of conference. A breeze fluttered sash ends and tugged at cloaks. Otherwise, the assembly was motionless and awesomely quiet. Still making no overtures, Van Rijk crossed to a stool and table which stood a little apart and seated himself. Dane went into the action required of him. Before his superior he set out a plastic pocket flask, its color as alive in the sunlight as the crudely cut gems which the Salariki sported, a fine silk handkerchief, and, last of all, a bottle of Terran smelling salts, provided by Medic Tau as a necessary restorative after some hours' combination of Salariki oratory and Salariki perfumes. Having thus done the duty of a liege man, Dane was at liberty to seat himself cross-legged on the ground behind his chief, as the other sons, heirs, and advisers had gathered behind their lords. The chieftain, whose arrival they had in a manner delayed, came in after them, and Dane saw that it was Fashdor, another piece of luck, since that clan was a small one and the chieftain had little influence. Had they so slowed Halfer, or Paft, 
it might be a different matter altogether. Fashtor was established at his seat, his belongings spread out, and Dane, counting unobtrusively, was certain that the council was now complete. Seven clans Traxt Cam had recorded divided the seacoast territory, and there were seven chieftains here. Indicative of the importance of this meeting, since some of these clans, beyond the radius of the shield piece, must be fighting a vicious blood feud at this very moment. Yes, seven were here. Yet there still remained a single stool, directly across the circle from Van Rijk. An empty stool. Who was the latecomer? That question was answered almost as it flashed into Dane's mind. But no Celeriki lordling came through the door. Dane's self-control kept him in his place, even after he caught the meaning of the insignia emblazoned across the newcomer's tunic. Traitor! And not only a traitor, but a company man. But why? And how? The companies only went after big game. This was a planet thrown open to free traders, the independence of the Star Lanes. By law and right, no company man had any place here. Unless... Behind a face Dane strove to keep as impassive as Van's, his thoughts raced. Traxed Cam as a free trader had bid for the right to exploit Sargal when its sole exportable product was deemed to be perfume a small, unimportant trade as far as the companies were concerned. And then the Koro stones had been found, and the importance of Sargal must have boomed as far as the big boys could see. They probably knew of Traxt Cam's death as soon as the patrol report on Limbo had been sent to headquarters. The companies all maintained their private information and espionage services. And, with Traxt Cam dead, without an heir, they had seen their chance and moved in. Only, Dane's teeth set firmly, they didn't have the ghost of a chance now. Legally, there was only one traitor on Sargal, and that was the Solar Queen. Captain Jellicoe had his record signed by the patrol to prove that. And all this intersolar man would do now was to bow out and try poaching elsewhere. But... The I.S. man appeared to be in no haste to follow that only possible course. He was seating himself with arrogant dignity on that unoccupied stool, and a younger man in I.S. uniform was putting before him the same type of equipment Dane had produced for Van Rijk. The cargo master of the Solar Queen showed no surprise, if the I.S.'s appearance had been such to him. One of the younger warriors in Paf's train got to his feet and brought his hands together with a clap which echoed across the silent gathering with the force of an archaic solid projectile shot. A Celeric, wearing the rich dress of the upper ranks, but also the collar forced upon a captive taken in combat, came into the enclosure carrying a jug in both hands. Preceded by Paf's son, he made the rounds of the assembly, pouring a purple liquid from his jug into the goblet before each chieftain, a goblet which Paf's heirs tasted ceremoniously before it was presented to the visiting clan leader. When they passed before Van Rijk, the Celeric nobleman touched the side of the plastic flask in token. It was recognized that off-world men must be cautious over the sampling of local products, and that when they joined the taking of the first cup of peace, they did so symbolically. Paft raised his cup, his gesture copied by everyone around the circle. In the harsh tongue of his race, he repeated a formula so archaic that few of the Salariki could now translate the sing-song words. They drank, and the meeting was formally opened. But it was an elderly Salaric seated to the right of Halfer, a man who wore no claw knife, and whose dusky yellow cloak and sash made a subdued note amid the splendor of his fellows, who spoke first, using the click-clack of the trade lingo his nation had learned from Cam. Under the white, 
he pointed to the shield aloft, we assemble to hear many things. But now come two tongues to speak where once there was but one father of a clan. Tell us, outlanders, which of you must we now hark to in truth? He looked from Van Rijk to the I.S. representative. The cargo master from the Queen did not reply. He stared across the circle at the company man. Dane waited eagerly. What was the I.S. going to say to that? But the fellow did have an answer, ready and waiting. It is true, fathers of clans, that here are two voices, where by right and custom there should only be one. But this is a matter which can be decided between us. Give us leave to withdraw from your sight and speak privately together. Then he who returns to you will be the true voice, and there shall be no more division. It was Paft who broke in before Halfer's spokesman could reply. It would have been better to have spoken together before you came to us. Go, then, until the shadow of the shield is not. Then return hither and speak truly. We do not wait upon the pleasure of outlanders. A murmur approved that tart comment. Until the shadow of the shield is not, they had until noon. Van Rijk arose and Dane gathered up his chief's possessions. With the same superiority to his surroundings he had shown upon entering, the cargo master left the enclosure, the Isies following. But they were away from the clearing, out upon the open road back to the Queen before the two from the company caught up with them. "'Captain Grange will see you right away,' the icy cargo master was beginning when Van Rijk met him with a quelling stare. "'If you poachers have anything to say, you say it at the Queen and to Captain Jellicoe,' he stated flatly and started on. Above his tight tunic collar, the other's face flushed. His teeth flashed as he caught his lower lip between them, as if to forcibly restrain an answer he longed to make. For a second he hesitated, and then he vanished down a side path with his assistant. Van Rijk had gone a quarter of the distance back to the ship before he spoke. "'I thought it was too easy,' he muttered. "'Now we're in for it. Maybe ride up the rockets.' By the spike tail of Exal, this certainly is not our lucky day. He quickened pace until they were close to trotting. End of chapter 1